All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so this is a joint work with many people. We have Chung Chun, Young Min Choi, Tim Gunei Su, Dong Yan Hong, Markus Kreutz, Georg Land, Mark Müller, Damien Stelle, and Min Jun Yi. Uh, to give you a brief overview of the scheme, so we basically started uh, where the lithium left off the Fiat Chamir with a bot over Euclidean lattices framework. And while the lithium had a goal, which was to make it easy to implement, we took, well, we aimed for something else, with, which was trying to minimize the signature size. This is achieved by two main uh, changes to the scheme. You replace the hypercubes that were used in Dilithium with hyperboles, and you go for a so-called bimodal version of the scheme. All that will become a bit clearer later on. Uh, the drawback of the hyperboles is that they are continuous, so you need to use either floating points or fixed points. So we tried to make fixed point arithmetic available at every step, which will allow us to, which allows us to get a constant time implementation and maybe hope for a masked implementation in the future. Um, so to see if we were successful at our bet of making sizes smaller, here's directly the comparison with performances. So we are indeed smaller than the lithium. You have like the ratio of the sizes on the last column, uh, but it's still not enough to reach Falcon level of compactness. And you can see that the main drawback of the scheme is that it is now much slower than the lithium between five and six times. Uh, however, we, we didn't do that on purpose. I mean, we tried to have all the uh, efficiency requirements that you have in structured lattices. So you work over a cyclotomic field with a modulus such that the field is fully splitting to have efficient entity and things like that. Since we have smaller uh, sizes, it means that we could also get lower dimensions and keep the same amount of security. So it means that we are actually using less arithmetic operations than the lithium, which is a bit uh, contradictory with the fact that we are slower. So we'll see why that is. And here I only reported on level two security, but we also have level three and five, just like for the lithium. Uh, all right, so now what I want to do is try to break down our scheme into small little pieces and try to explain at each step what's the difference with what Dilithium was doing or what's similar. Uh, my main, my first piece is actually the whole scheme because I want to do some recap on the Fiat Chamir with the bots uh, paradigm in Euclidean lattices. So you have the following blueprint. Uh, you start by sampling a short vector y, following some distribution q, which we will specify later. Using a public matrix i, you, a, you will hash it to get a challenge, and you will answer that challenge by computing a vector z, which is going to be y plus sc, where s is your short secret key, or y minus sc. So this is where the bimodal name comes from, because you have two possible centers for z. For z. And the goal is now to erase this center. Because if you were to release Z at this point, then you would be leaking uh, the center, so you would be leaking your secret key. So we have an ugly rejection step, uh, and you have to believe me when I say that this is done so that Z in the end follows an independent distribution P. So you erased the centers. All right. During key generation, you made sure to have a secret key such that AS is equal to its opposite, mod 2Q. So you can actually recompute A times Y with the following equation on top. The J vector is some public vector. It's going to be one and then all zeros. By doing so, you can rehash uh, this commitment, verify that the challenge is consistent, and since we are working in lattices, uh, we check that Z is small because that's where the harmness of the uh, scheme will come from. So this, my, this bimodal setting is actually a generalization of bliss, if that speaks to some people in the audience. And we've shown that this setting could lead to more compact signatures 
uh, than the unimodal setting from Dilithium, hence why we went for that um, specific setting. And something that uh, you should try to remind for to remind for the rest of this talk is that the compactness of the scheme is driven by how good you can control the norm of S times C. Because if you have centers that are already close to zero, it's easier to erase them than some that are far away. Uh, so Dilithium for P and Q, they instantiated it with discrete hypercubes. And our choice is the continuous uniform distributions over hypercubes. So why is that? Uh, this is because you can show that this is the most compact distribution you can get, you can use for signatures. And it's actually a tie-in with Gaussian distributions. So it may be a bit surprising that we didn't go for Gaussian distributions, but you'll see that the rejection probability step is much easier with those hyperboles than with uh, Gaussian distributions, where you have some transcendental function to evaluate at a point which depends from the secret, making it very hard to get a constant time implementation of it. It's continuous because when you do the theoretical uh, study of this rejection thing, you, you have like some ratio of volumes of hyperbole. It's much easier to compute for like continuous hyperboles than for discrete ones. But we'll see how we can discretize, discretize that later on. And since we don't want the verifier to deal with any kind of floating point or fixed point arithmetic, we will round the final signature before outputting it. This also means that this rounding step is done in the hash to keep it consistent uh, for verification. So this is a small subtlety there. So. What I want to talk about now is the rejection step and try to make and try to convince you that there is an interest in choosing hyperboles instead of Gaussian distributions. So let's uh, try to think together about when do you want to keep and when do you want to reject a sample. So what's going to happen is that your vector z, if you think about it, it's going to be sampled uniformly inside of one of the two white circles. Uh, with probability one half each. And then you know that if it's outside the colored area, you will not keep it, you will reject it because it's outside your target uh, hyperbole. If it's inside the surface area, there are two cases. If it's inside the blue area, you'll notice that it's the part where the two hyperboles are actually overlapping. So it means that this part is overrepresented uh, with respect to the green area outside. So what, you, what we do is we flip a coin and with probability one half, we keep it, otherwise we don't. This allows us to compensate for this overrepresentation. And this coin flip is independent from the secret. I mean, as long as you know that you're in the blue zone, then it's independent from the secret. Uh, so how do we know in which zone we lie actually? So we can first take a look at the norm of Z, which will tell us if we are in the colored or white area. And then we can take a look at the norm of 2Z minus Y. If this norm is long, it means that we lie in the, in the green area that is opposite to it. If it's short, it means that we are in the blue area that's in the middle. And we can't be in the um, green area that's close to it because Y is not long enough to reach that part. So we can easily check uh, with two Euclidean norms, and then we may have to flip a coin or not, and that is our rejection step. So it's not as easy as Dilithium, but it's still very uh, much easier than computing exponential or hyperbolic cosine. Uh, there is still some kind of elephant in the room there. It's how do we actually sample from hyperbole distributions uh, there is, in an ironic twist of fate, a result that says that if you take a normal distribution with two extra coordinates, normalize it, and then get rid of these two extra coordinates, you get something that's uniform in the hyperbole due to some uh, projective geometry uh, results. So this works for continuous distribution. And what we do to work with fixed point arithmetic is to sample actually from discrete Gaussians with a very large standard deviation. 
And then we have some discretization step for the hyperbole. So we actually uh, try to sample uniformly over some discrete hyperbole, which correspond to the fixed point precision. And if you have a large enough standard deviation and a, and a small enough discretization step, then this will, um, I mean, th this result translates to the discrete setting. This actually changes a little bit the analysis that comes later on because you are now rejecting from discrete hyperbole to discrete hyperbole. So the global rejection probability changes a little bit in the sense that your number of iterations may grow a little bit or maybe a lot. We don't really know, except if you know how to count how many points there are in a in an hyperbole. Uh, but we know that if the discretization step is small enough, then this will be actually close enough to the continuous anal analysis. And fortunately for us, there is a way to balance out these two uh, discretization constraints so that one of them is not much bigger than the other or something. Uh, but unfortunately, our maybe very conservative analysis of the precision required leads us to having an hyperbole sampler that actually takes up to 80% of the signing runtime, which is basically where all the slowdown from the signing procedure comes from with respect to, <coughs> to the lithium. Uh, but fortunately for us, this is a very like plug and play part of the scheme, which means that any improvement that, that can be uh, made to either our analysis or even any other kind of hyperbole sampler you can think of can be plugged into Hete directly and well, this would lead to huge savings in runtime and would make this uh, trade-off between signature sizes and runtime, well, much more in our favor. So we hope that with some further analysis, we can actually very improve that by a lot. So let's go down, let's go back to more uh, standard things, I'd say, and I, Want us, I want to talk briefly about how we compute the challenges. So in a similar fashion to Dilithium, our challenges are polynomials with a fixed Hamming weight. And Dilithium had ternary polynomials. Uh, but in Hete, the challenge is only ever seen mod 2. So if we were to take ternary challenges, this would only create vulnerabilities in the scheme. So we have to go for binary challenges. It's unfortunate for us because we lose a little bit of entropy. So we have to increase the number of non-zero coefficients in the polynomial, which means that the norm of S times C, which drives the uh, hyperbole radius, is now a little bit higher. But this will be compensated later on. And apart from this, it's all very similar to Dilithium. I mean, our sample in Bull algorithm is the same. We just don't add the sign that they do. And this is it. There's a cave at for level five, but it's uh, very uh, negligible. Next, I want to briefly talk about the key generation algorithm because you may be a bit puzzled about how we can get such keys. It's actually quite easy. Uh, we first generate an LWE sample and we use that to add an extra column in our public matrix, which will serve as a trapdoor. So by doing so, we can actually map AS to anything we want. Uh, it suffices to replace the QJ on line 4 with whatever you want. Uh, there are two points I want to draw your attention on in this key generation algorithm. The first one is the time is the fact that we have A that is in almost HNF form, except that instead of identity, we have two times identity. This will come back to haunt us later on. And we have the second thing is that we have a rejection step on line six. The function F2 is something that depends on the canonical embeddings of S, and it's really tailored to have a fine grain control on the norm of S times C. So we can uh, change the acceptance rate. It's for the three parameter sets that we have between 10 and 25%, and it compensates for the previous increase in the entropy, but it also allows us to uh, make this norm much lower than it would be if we didn't have this step and just relied on theoretical analysis 
of the norm of S times C, like standard bounds that we could get. Uh, the final thing I want to describe in the algorithm is that we have two ways of making the signature a bit smaller. The first one is a very standard technique that was introduced by Bay and Galbraith for those uh, Fiat-Chami overboards over Euclidean lattices. And it relies on the fact that we have an identity in the public matrix A. All right, so the part of the signature that mu that's multiplied for, by this identity, if you are to get rid of the low bits of those, uh, of those coordinates, then you almost didn't change the high bits of the result, all right? So you can get rid of them in the signature. Uh, and this is where the fact that we don't have identity, but two times identity comes back, because now if we get rid of the low bits of Z2, we are uh, shifting what cannot be recovered anymore from the commitment. Hence, in the algorithm, here we are hashing the high bits of W and its least significant bit. It comes from the two times Z2 that we have here. Uh, other, than, other than that, it works exactly as in Dilithium. We have some kind of hint that is incorporated to the high bits of Z2 that allows to make the computation right because we may have some carries that appear uh, and that are not appearing anymore if we remove the low bits. The final uh, thing is the actual encoding of the scheme. It is some um, information theoretic uh, encoding. And we've recently had, I mean, some feedback about how this encoding was causing some troubles. Uh, this is on its way to be fixed. For instance, the encoding was not unique. It will be in a future release that should be there very soon. It also used a lot of uh, RAM. That is not the case anymore. And we are also playing uh, a bit with something called TANS that would replace the RANS um, that reduces even more the RAM usage. But uh, anyway, all, all of that is has a very negligible cost in signing runtime. So all the fixes that we are implementing will have a negligible impact on the scheme. Uh, finally, just so we are clear on how we estimate the security, everything is similar to Dilithium uh, because we are in the same framework and the proofs are a bit generic. Basically, all the theoretical reductions that you have for Dilithium, they also hold for us. Uh, and in a practical manner, we've really followed their, foot their footsteps. So if you want to do key recovery, you have an LW instance to solve. If you want to do a forgery, there's a particular sense instance to solve. And then we use their scripts that they provided to evaluate how difficult those steps are. Uh, thank you for your attention. This is where I, st I stop. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. <laughs>